The River Ribble in North Yorkshire, England is a thing of beauty. Meandering from the market town of Settle to the village of Long Preston, it is a lowland river in an upland setting. Its ever-changing currents, however, have upset the ecosystems at a site of special scientific interest. Attempts over centuries to extensively drain the surrounding 162 hectares for grazing livestock had also affected the landscape and wildlife habitat. Draining water quickly from the floodplain affected the breeding success of wetland birds at one of the best inland sites in England. The Ribble is largely confined to the channel by flood banks and by historic dredging and deepening. So natural flooding events are now very limited and the erosive power of the river scours sediment from the riverbed and banks. Livestock access to the river has inhibited vegetation along stepped banks. The consequences? Disrupted spawning grounds had diminished fish stocks and some of the 60 species of visiting birds had disappeared. The aquatic environment was poor in water crowfoot, water starwort and pondweed species. Bankside woodland was almost completely absent except for a few scattered sycamore, young alder and crack willow. Finding a solution was not going to be easy. Some 18 landowners and tenants had an interest in the area with up to a dozen groups and agencies, from anglers to local authorities, would closely monitor any plans to alter the course of the river or its environs. Collaborative working was key. Through a mixture of diplomacy, painstaking scientific appraisal and meticulous consultation has evolved the Long Preston Deeps Wet Grassland Project. This is a partnership between the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, Natural England, the Environment Agency, the Yorkshire Dells Millennium Trust, the Ribble Rivers Trust, North Yorkshire County Council, local landowners and tenants, and the Yorkshire Dells National Park Authority. Formed in 2004 and originally focused on restoring the wet grassland, the project has called upon cutting-edge technology to optimise the river flow over seven kilometres. In 2010, a detailed plan of works for the river was drawn up. Ongoing restoration projects aim to allow natural flooding to occur by once again reconnecting the river to its floodplain. Hydromorphology specialists have mapped the river's contours. Riverbanks have been moved. Channels, called chutes, have been created. The river has found its natural rhythm. As a result, salmon and brown trout numbers have increased and stocks of grayling and chub will also grow. The work has enhanced bird life too, by encouraging farmers to alter their grazing regimes and to cut rushes for winter cattle bedding. This creates a varied grassland structure with lots of short areas for birds to feed their young. Raised water levels provide shallow pools of water full of aquatic and vertebrate food and plenty of muddy edges for birds to probe. The partnership is working with farmers so they can graze the floodplain in a way which integrates with an economic farming system while also providing improved services to the environment. An RSPB expert believes the project is one of the most successful farm wetland restoration schemes in the United Kingdom. The site now supports at least 80 pairs of nationally important breeding wading birds. They come in spring along with other species like curlew, redshank, snipe and lapwing. Sand martins thrive in the sandbanks with less risk of being washed out. The wetlands are also home to winter wildfowl species such as teal, paintail and widgeon. Marsh harriers, buzzards, peregrine falcons, kestrels and sparrowhawks come to hunt too. A newly planted woodland near the riverbank will provide shelter for anglers and wildlife alike. Banks and other areas have stabilised. A good example of the partnership working came in 2011, when a flood bank burst following a bleak winter. All the partners came together and took the opportunity to start work on restoration. Flood banks were moved back and revetment removed, resulting in the river and around six hectares of its floodplain being reunited. The success led to more phases being planned and implemented in 2012, when more than 3.5 kilometres of river were restored and 15 hectares of floodplain reconnected. Now more landowners and tenants want to be involved. 
visitors who come from all over the world to walk in the region and to enjoy the wildlife, flora and fauna will benefit. And the wetlands is set to become a popular research destination for schools and university students. With improved resistance to climate change, the Ribble at Long Preston Deeps will be a treasure for future generations. The beauty about this scheme is that it has been done in such a way that everyone has been able to input their uh, objectives, their suggestions, and it's been discussed so that we can try and find a uh, solution that allows us all to achieve what, what we need to achieve. And so that is one of the, the fantastic things about this project is the way in which the partners have come together uh, and discussed and, and found a mutually acceptable solution. I don't think that the project is finished yet. I think that uh, there is more tree planting, there are more bank stabilisation, there are more, um, there are a lot more things that can be done to improve both uh, adjacent to the site, further down the river, but also within the site itself. So some of the things that we'll possibly look to do with the trees once they become established in maybe 20 or 30 years is to see if there are ways that we can introduce some of those into the channel to, to make additional in-channel habitat. The requirement here was, was not to, to physically necessarily restore the river system, but to try to what's called naturalise it, which was actually to allow the processes, uh, the way the water flows, to operate the way it used to in a sense, and to, and to bring it back in, in connection with the floodplain. So um, that involved just tweaking the system in a sense, not, not doing very heavy engineering, but starting the system off and then allowing natural river processes to occur um, which would then create and, and um, restore some of the dynamic habitats which were here in the past. So it's, it's, it's all about reconnection and re-establishing those links which we've, we've lost. The naturalisation project that, that, that is going on here at Long Preston is, is, is almost unique in, in, in the UK in the sense that it's, it's a triple SI site and we've, we've been given the opportunity and the space and the river's been given the opportunity and the space to to, to effectively become natural again. And that for me has been a, a, a real um, a bonus. It's one of the few schemes that I've, I've been able to work on during my career where we've, we've um, been able to achieve that level of um, success, really. In the past, a lot of things have been constrained. Here, we, we, we're really able to, to move things forward and work with the river. This project's differed from others, really, that I've worked on in there are a lot of many, many different stakeholders really, with varying interests, you know, from from ourselves who are interested in the wildlife side, there's obviously the farmers on the wider floodplain, uh, there's the anglers and their interests and uh, uh, the local communities in terms of what, what and they're going to have to fit into ecosystem services, we like to call it these days, which is the flood protection, you know, and the, the, the climate change mitigation and things like that. So. There's lots of different interests and it's just trying to bring all those together in it and it's that way of working through the project and regular meetings and having people on a daily basis engaging with, with everybody uh, and communicating those interests better I think than any other project that I've worked on. In terms of the overall project I think it was, uh, it, took, it took a while to get going and you need to build those relationships up at the start for you know one, two, three years not much seems to get done on the ground, but you're building those relationships and that pays off very well, I think, later on. Um, so now that we've, we've started the project and we've, we've got a few things actually done on the ground and people can see what's happening and uh, see the benefits of those and how they can accommodate that into their own circumstances, and particularly in terms of the farmers, how they can uh, accommodate the, the movement of those flood banks and the planting of the trees into their normal farming operations. That, um, you know, once we've seen that, then the project can develop on that, I think, and it, now it's moving along very well, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the, the farmers are very, very interested along the floodplain, I think, in how, how it's been going and, and the benefits that, that that's having to the wider environment in, in this area. My role with, the, with this project really is to, is, was to come in after the restoration had initially taken place and to monitor it using the, the laser scanner that we've got to create a digital terrain model. 
From that digital terrain model, I then simulated the, what the river would do at a, various, a variety of different um, scenarios, if you like. So what would happen at high discharge? Would this area be inundated? Would the concentration of velocity still be in the areas that it was trying to protect against? And then what would happen next? Then after a, 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 an event, a flood event, I would then come back and then take another uh, reading, do another survey, and then take one image from the other image and then see where you've actually got deposition, erosion, that sort of thing. It was really a case of monitoring it and to hope that the aspirations of the, of the team um, were actually right. So what they were aiming to achieve was actually along the right lines or better, and that's exactly what's happened. So the sorts of things that they hoped to happen, I've sort of proven that has happened and is continuing to, to work to the, to the best effect for the, for the river. A lot of projects just use fixed photography, so someone will go back to the same point and just take one particular photograph, which is okay. But this this maps the entire, you know, the, the entire reach, so we get to see little bits of erosion here, little bits of deposition there, and and the actual equipment can go down to centimetre detail. So it, it's as much as you want to make of it. When the engineers came in, they they made quite a straight channel. But that's actually starting to develop, the gravels are starting to come in, we start to get to see a lot of the invertebrates uh, building into the system. Soon you'll get pools and riffles uh, and the normal natural geomorphology will, will start ar arising from these um, man-made channels into something much, much more natural. That's the exciting bit, that's why this area is unique, because it's dynamic, it's changing, but it doesn't require any maintenance, it's self-sustaining and the river is doing what it wants to do and that's what's interesting for me is to see how that natural river is responding to a little bit of a push here from, from sort of human influence. My work um, started to look at how we could improve the access onto the site uh, and how we could enable people to come down here and experience a wetland. And so over the, the last sort of eight years or so we've had lots of school groups involved, uh, lots of Places running bird courses would come down here and you know, see what they can uh, see in, at this time of year. Universities come here, whether it's demonstrating sort of hydrology to their students or sustainable tourism. Uh, I think from Leeds University have been coming for about every five years now. This site is really important for, for birds, and it's always it's always been an interesting site. We hold historical records where up to 90 over 90 species have been recorded on this area, but it's particularly relevant and part of the site of special scientific interest, about 65 hectares at the southern end between Wigglesworth and Long Preston is specifically designated for breeding waders. So we've got good populations of lapwing, curlew, redshank, snipe and oyster catcher, which are the reasons why that part of SSSI is designated. Obviously further north, it's for different reasons, it's mainly for the geomorphological interest of the river, but it's got lots of birds as we see behind, there's lots of sand martins flying around which use the riverbanks to, to breed in, kingfishers um, and all sorts of other species migrating through this area. It's a north, south, east, west um, migration highway really for birds moving around the country and it's a really great area and anything can turn up at any time and it's really important in that regard. If the work hadn't have uh, gone ahead, we would have lost uh, much of the river bank, uh, they would have deteriorated, continued to deteriorate. Uh, many of the spawning gravel riffles would have been lost, we would have lost many of the fish, and we would have lost many of the pools. Well, the benefits of anglers probably started with the fencing and the growing of the uh, natural grasses. That will hold back uh, many uh, diffused pollutions from the uh, fields around us, so that will protect the river from that uh, point of view. We're looking forward to the next four or five years when the trees start to appear out of their uh, protective sleeves and then they, that will keep the winds at a reasonable level, we're hoping, so there's lots to come. I think my involvement was identifying some of the uh, areas where certainly fisheries could benefit, so we identified a stream that had been cut off from the main river uh, naturally, uh, which we could put back to the main river, this will uh, recreate a spawning stream for brown trout and you know its value to the upper river is just top really, you can't, you can't get any more for wild breeding. Well the work that's been done since 2004, predominantly it will allow the river to flow out in, in high spates, uh, created what I think you know as chutes or off channels and they will allow the river to flow out into what would have 
naturally been the floodplain, which would, you know, naturally before man got involved and built flood banks, that's what would have happened. So it allows that to happen and that in itself disperses the velocity of the water and stops erosion or, or minimises erosion. So what we end up with is the spawning gravels where the salmon, the trout, the chub, everything else spawn, instead of getting washed away down river, they're allowed to stabilise and that in turn, you know, obviously protects the fish more in the future. Although we've lost uh, a bit of land for grazing um, by planting trees and fencing the riversides and things, I think uh, in the long term it's been more, advan more advantageous to us because uh, we can just manage the land so much better now that it's fenced, uh, our, our stock's fenced in, um, it's not roaming. When the river used to get low we used to get trouble with uh, cattle and sheep crossing the river and um, and getting mixed up with our neighbours and same with our neighbours coming back over and things like that so you know I'm not really worried about losing a bit of grazing land I think as a whole um, when the trees grow and everything and everything and uh, it's just going to be better altogether. It means that we haven't just got as much uh, land to mow to make a crop but Hopefully the, the banking that's been created in our side and the trees that have been planted, it will hold the land together better and make it so that the river doesn't get into the field and eat away any more valuable land. The scheme has been a success. We, we just now need to wait and make sure the trees uh, grow and hold the banking and the, what was the field together. Um, when, the, when it rains, it, it does come up and it isn't as fast flowing. We could see possibilities, but we were conscious that the well there was bound to be drawbacks. But it was a case of at least let's listen to what they want to do and then uh, make a judgment about whether we wanted to participate or not. Some of the changes they were proposing um, in farming terms were were unacceptable, um, but by the same token, we weren't so naive to assume that that. Um, some of the changes, because a lot of the lands are triple SI, there were some changes required. Uh, and so then it was, from our point of view, trying to um, get the various agencies to understand that they need to take account of, of our needs as, as farming businesses, as well as um, trying to tick their boxes with the triple SI and the wetlands and what have you. Some of our grazing is restricted to the amount of stock uh, we can put on until after uh, nesting season for wading birds. Um, uh, which I suppose in farming terms is a, is a downside if you will but um, some of the works where some of the embankments have been moved back uh, we think have made a benefit because the river's got more elbow room it doesn't rise as high now so uh, when it's in full flood which um, you know is a, is a definite benefit um, some of the other things it's going to be wait and see you know we don't know yet.